Hi, Lorna, and everyone else. You sound great. That's wonderful. You're really excited. Looking forward to the show. Here it is. Peggy, can you talk for a minute? I just need to check the settings on uh, the screen capture, please. Sure, I'd be happy to talk for a minute. And I notice a couple of people are having a problem hearing the music. So just keep trying. I'm also on a Mac, and it is playing for me. You do have to click on play um, to be able to hear it. And sometimes it freezes up, and we need to just reload the web tour. So if you continue to have a problem, um, we'll do that. Sorry, Peggy, I need to do it again, please. Oh my, <laughs> you really expecting me to keep talking? <laughs> this is a test for Lorna's audio. And um, I was giving advice about how to use the music player for the pre-show music. Okay, it sounds good. like some are hearing it and some are not. Wonderful. Welcome to all of you. Welcome, everyone, and welcome to the Classroom 2.0 live session today. We are so glad that you have joined us today. I'm Kim Case, and I'm pleased to co-host with Peggy George and Lorna Costantini. And today we're going to be talking about succeeding with Web 2.0 projects with Terry Friedman. Each week at the same time, we gather to discuss ways to use and engage students using technology. Our session is one hour and it's recorded and posted to our live site at live.classroom20.com. We post the video, audio recording, and chat log on that site so that you can um, subscribe and get that information each week. Before we begin, I'd like to review some of the features that we're going to be using today in Illuminate for those who are new to the session. Just below the participant window is a hand with a green arrow on it. And if you'd like to ask a question or share something, please raise your hand and we'll give you the ability to use your microphone to speak at that time. Just next to the hand are two emoticons, the applause symbol and the thumbs down symbol. And the far right is a blue door that you can click on if you need to step away for a moment. And then we'll know that you're not available at that time. And just to the left of the blue door is a check and a green X. And we'll be using those for polling today. At the very bottom is the, or just below that is the chat window where you can type your message and then click send. Make sure the words this room is visible so that your message goes to the entire room. If you'd like to send a message to the moderators or a specific person, you can use the drop down arrow and make your selection and then click send. Just remember all private messages um, are seen by the moderator. In the very bottom left is the microphone button. It's like a walkie-talkie. You click on it to speak. And then when you're finished speaking, you click on it to deactivate your microphone. And just to the left of the whiteboard are some tools that we're going to be using. If you would like to change the view or you can't see all of the chat, you can go up and click on View and then click on Layouts. And sometimes it's locked. So you can click on unlock on um, layout lock to unlock it, and then you can select any of the desired layouts that you'd like that are default in Illuminate, or you can resize the individual windows to fit your preference. Today we're going to be using the laser pointer of the whiteboard tools, and the laser pointer is the blue one with the red kind of starburst at the end. So 
So if everybody now will please click on the starburst, the wand, the laser pointer, and then indicate your location on the world map. so that we can kind of see where everybody's from. And I'm seeing lots of places in the United States and up in Canada as well as several places in Europe and that's fantastic. And Terry is from the United Kingdom as well as some locations over near Asia. And we are so grateful that you've taken your time today on Saturday to join us wherever you are in the world. Okay, we're going to go ahead and go on to our polling questions. And our polling questions, you'll see the polling features to the left of the blue door. And normally we offer closed captioning services, but uh, Tammy Moore had a commitment and she's unable to be with us today. And her creating Whiteboard Labs session just after ours at Learn Central is going to be canceled for today as well. So let's go ahead and move on to this polling question. And are you using Web 2.0 tools in your classroom with your students? If you are, please click on the green check. And if you're not at the time, please click on the red X. Some of us uh, may not be working directly with students in the classroom. Yeah. So you may need to click the red X for that reason. So go ahead now and make your and cast your vote. The green check or the red X next to the blue door just below the participant window. And then I'll go ahead and get those results. And it looks like about 15% are not using Web 2.0 tools with students right now. And 63% of us in the group are using Web 2.0 tools with our, our students in the classrooms. Okay, the next one, we're going to go ahead and post up um, a URL for you to access and to complete a poll. And the question is, is for you to please answer the two questions in the Google form about web tool projects. And so we're going to go ahead and put that link in a web tour. And let me go ahead and get that link for us real quickly. And then if you could fill that out and give that uh, information to Terry, we would greatly appreciate that. And so take a few seconds to fill out those two questions. You can go ahead and fill it out on the web tour right now by just indicating and checking and indicating your uh, responses. And then when you're finished, please click Submit. And I'll give you a few more minutes to do that. And then Terry can get the results. And if you're unable to see the web tour, I'll go ahead and post the link in the chat. And then you can access that link externally from the Illuminate. You can click and drag out the web tour window and resize it by just clicking on the edges and then dragging it out. And then there are two questions, so you may need to use the slider on the very right to scroll down the page to complete the second question and then get to the Submit button. And it is a Google Form, and we love Google Forms too, and that's how we 
uh, collaborate on all of our uh, sessions and prepare our sessions are through Google Forms. Okay, I'm going to go ahead now and go on. And we're going to be talking today about see, succeeding with Web 2.0 and um, creating successful projects that use Web 2.0 tools with our students. And we have a very special guest, Terry Friedman. And I'm going to pass it now over to Peggy, who's going to take over. And we're just going to leave the web tour up for a little bit longer. And then um, we'll go ahead and continue. And I'm not seeing the results. I'm seeing a login to the Google Docs. So now, Peggy, back to you. And, okay. Um, great. Thank, Thank you. you, Kim. I didn't realize you weren't seeing the the survey results uh, because I was seeing them on my screen. So that's probably because I was logged into it. So um, I brought the survey back up. If anyone wants to continue filling it in while I introduce Terry, that would be great. And then we'll go to his slides. I am so proud and excited to have Terry Friedman as our special guest today. Terry has worked in education since 1975. He's been a teacher. He's been a department head. He's worked at the UK's Qualifications and Curriculum Authority. Um, he was an Ofsted inspector for ICT and business education. And now he's an independent educational I. CT consultant. He publishes his own website, ictandeducation.org, and um, also a regular newsletter called Computers in Classrooms, which is something I just look forward to each month when it comes out. He's a prolific writer. He has contributed articles to tons of journals. Um, many blog posts. He's had over 12 books published. And he's a member of the UK Society of Authors. I could go on and on. I mean, Terry has done some incredible things. But I've known Terry since about 2005 when I had the great fortune to get to spend some time with him in Phoenix following NEC 2006, which was in San Diego. We were very excited in Arizona to be one of the first to announce his coming of age ebook in 2006 at our ASTI conference. David Warlick was one of the contributors to the book, and he was also our keynote speaker that year. Also, our very own ASTI member, Sean Wheeler, was a contributor to the book and was at the conference. So it was a really exciting day for us. If you have not read the Coming of Age ebook, it's available on Terry's website. It's a free download. And it's amazing that even though it was published several years ago, the information is still relevant and helpful. Ever since I met Terry, I've been a regular reader of his website, his Computers in Classrooms newsletter, and have been able to collaborate with him on so many things. I know you're going to love hearing from him. He is always inspiring always thought-provoking, very practical, and in my opinion, humorous and witty. We have provided links to many of his resources in our GLAM links today. And I know you're going to want to spend time exploring all of them. So welcome, Terry. We're so looking forward to this. And I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Peggy. Um, it's really hard to follow an introduction like that. Can you all hear me? I assume yes. <laughs> OK. Um, well, I'd just like to start by thanking Peggy and her colleagues at Classroom 2.0 for the, the, um, for the opportunity to do this presentation and have this discussion with you today. And what I'd like to do is outline the factors which I think help to ensure that a project involving Web 2.0 applications is successful. Uh, and the way I'd like to approach that is by a case study approach. 
And um, I have to say I've cheated a little bit because the case study I'm going to talk to you about doesn't actually involve Web 2.0. It involves a huge multimedia project um, plus several other kind of uh, satellite projects, I suppose you'd describe them as. But I do think that all the factors which can make for the success of a 2.0 project, uh, sorry, a Web 2.0 project, would also have an impact on any kind of project like that. Uh, and the other kind of little bit of cheating I've done is in my definition of Web 2.0. And I, I, I don't know if people know this, but my subject, my teaching subject originally was economics. And economists are always arguing, or were always arguing, about what constitutes money. You know, is it just notes and coins? Is it bank drafts? Is it checks? Uh, and then someone came up with a bright idea of saying, why, why don't we say that if something is used as money and people accept it as money, and in other words, if it kind of looks like money and it acts like money and people think it's money, why don't we call it money? And um, everyone said, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> so um, I've kind of adopted the same approach to Web 2.0, which is a very pragmatic one, I think, which is that if something enables you to collaborate and interact with other people, then why not just call it Web 2.0? That's what I've done. And I'm sorry if any, any of you are a bit purist about this. But I, I do think that's, um, that's just a very pragmatic approach. And anyway, the, uh, the, the multimedia project that I'm going to discuss will actually, oh, thanks for that, but will actually lead on to Web 2.0 kind of stuff. They've already been using podcasting, and they're going to be talking about blogs uh, and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, just to give you, uh, just to put you in the picture about this, about this project, uh, I've, to put it into context, I was asked to write a bid for some government money in the UK for, in UK money, what is £500,000. So half a million pounds, which is roughly $800,000. And the idea was to bid, for, to bid for this money in order to be able to buy um, multimedia type equipment for six primary schools, uh, which are elementary schools. And I wrote the bid, and, uh, the, and that was successful. So we got the money. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the context. I'll just, here, just move this on a little bit. Um, this is what I'm going to be talking about. So I hope you don't mind listening to my voice. I'll, I'll be showing you a few things, but I'll be talking a lot as well. So first of all, where I'm coming from. Uh, well, I'm coming from the UK, but I didn't mean that. Um, this is the way I think about things. I, I, I've, I've looked at um, all, all, all of the Classroom 2.0 live sessions. And I really, really enjoy reading that, that kind of stuff and listening to it. And um, I've really got a lot from them. But one of the things, or the main thing which interests me, is how do you actually get some, something started in a real classroom with real kids? And this isn't to say anything against um, this forum here, because uh, that, that's, that's generally how I feel when I go to conferences. So if I go to a conference and I'm listening to some visionary, I always think, well, this is great and it's really entertaining. Uh, how is this going to help me on Monday morning with my 15-year-olds? With my so I always like to have something really practical that I can take away, take away with me. Yeah, that graphic of the little ones, that, that's the e, E13 learning community. That's their own logo. It's not something I... I developed. I'll talk a bit, little bit about this learning community in a second. Um, okay, so what I'd also like to achieve with, with this presentation is that I'm hoping that um, as a result of listening to me, there might be one or two things that I say that will make anyone who's thinking of starting a Web 2.0 project a little bit less daunting. Because we'll know the project I'm going to talk about involved something like 3,000 children. In fact, it's still involving them. 3,000 children 
six primary schools or elementary schools, one secondary school or high school, um, a local authority, and $800,000. Although it's involving all of that and more, which I'll talk about soon, I do actually think a lot of the principles can be applied on a very much smaller scale. And that to me is a hallmark of a good project really, that it could be scaled up or scaled down. Um, yeah, I will be um, talking about the, uh, all, all the, um, sorry, I've lost the plot here slightly. Yeah, I'll be talking about the schools in the area soon. Okay, but I, what I want to do actually is start from the end. I want to talk to you about how the um, project is looking now to kind of inspire you, okay? Um, okay, so let me talk to you about all of the kind of general things which are happening now. Basically, a group of schools called the E13 Learning Community in the London Borough of Newham have been carrying out um, an experiment. Okay, well, I'm not sure what happened there. Okay, so let me talk to you about the E13 Learning Community. Um, now, the London Borough of Newham is there, okay, and just to give you a little bit of perspective, the E13 learning community is what is known as a soft federation. So, what that means is it means that a group of schools have come together to work together and collaborate together, but it's not, um, it's not, a, how can you describe it? It is a, form, it is a formal setup, but not such that people in one school are working for another school and all of that kind of thing. It, it's not quite as rigid as that. It's called a soft federation and this particular one is called the E13 Learning Community because it's based, uh, it comprises six schools which are in Newham, which is in, in the postcode, which is our version of the zip code, called E13. Okay, and um, this, this borough, just to give you a little bit of perspective on it, um, actually I'll come back to that in a minute. Let me just talk to you about this project. Sorry to jump about, I'm trying to look at three or four different things at once and as I'm male I find it really hard to multitask. So actually I'm not going to try, okay. So um, I went into the school after they'd, they'd um, got started with this project and I talked to the children to find out what they'd learnt. And what really struck me is not just how much they'd learned, but also how perceptive they are. So, for example, something which um, really sticks in my mind, it really made me laugh, was when I, I was speaking to a, 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 a little group of 10-year-olds about how they collaborated on a video-making project, and I asked them how they got on with each other and how they resolved their problems, well, their disagreements. And this 10-year-old girl said to me, we managed to sort out our problems without hitting each other. Um, now, that's humorous on one level, but I think actually that, uh, in that one statement you've got uh, a, an indication of the kind of profound learning that has taken place. Now, I'd like to actually put this in perspective. Let me just do this. Because something which has recently been introduced in, into the curriculum in England and Wales is personal learning and thinking skills and you've got them there, team working, independent inquiry, so on and so on and so forth. And these are meant to be 21st, uh, 21st century skills. But, but the key thing here that I'd like to draw your attention to is the fact that these are actually meant for secondary school. They're meant to start from 11 years old upwards. So here you've got children in primary school actually achieving some of those aims and I think that's 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 quite um, quite useful to bear in mind you know if you've got the right kind of project and the right equipment the right attitude and all the right things in place you can really achieve a lot and um, I think what you what you'd agree from that little girl's statement is that she's got at least some understanding of team working she, she understands about effective participation and, and she's actually reflected on what she's learned. So there's an element of reflective learning there as well. Now, uh, the head teacher who's in charge, who was in overall charge of this project, um, someone called Maggie, wasn't surprised at all. And what she said was, 
but this is a quote. What this project has shown is that once you put good facilities in children's hands and help them take responsibility, they become responsible young people. Now I think that's something which is, which is worth reflecting on um, just for a moment because if you give children responsibility, they, they will act resp responsibly. And, and I would also add that if you give them something worthwhile and relevant to, to do, they, they will act responsibly. But I'm probably getting a little bit ahead of myself there. Um, now, my, someone called Michael Doughty, who's the assistant head teacher, uh, head teacher is our equivalent of uh, principal, um, the assistant head teacher for learning technology at the same school as Maggie, said to me, and this is a quote, what this project has done is to give each child a voice. Even painfully shy and profoundly deaf children have played an equal part to the other children. We are delighted. And I think what that demonstrates is that what you've got here is an underlying attitude of no excuses. Because I, I do think it's very easy for people to, perhaps with all the best will in the world, to say, well, so-and-so is deaf, or they've got special needs, or they've got this, or they've got that, so we can't expect quite so much from them. And I think what this project has shown is that um, that, that is not really correct. But if you have high expectations, then you tend to, 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 to get the results you're looking for. So is, is it simply a case of finding a whole load of money and then throwing it at, throwing it at schools in, in the form of new technology? Well, the answer is absolutely not. Someone called Paul Stratton, who coordinated the project at the local authority level, which is, I think, similar to a school district in the USA, um, believes that the success of the project is down to the dedication of the teachers and the way in which the schools and the federation have worked together in the planning and the administration of the project. And other things that I would put in from having been involved in the project is I would include good training delivered in a timely manner. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, not, not just, um, too often training is given, I think, which is on 15th of November we're having PowerPoint training. It doesn't matter whether you actually um, need PowerPoint training on the 15th of November, that's when we're having it. And the other thing is, I've just used PowerPoint because usually that's used incredibly badly. Like in my presentation here, you know, you just kind of bore people into submission with a whole load of bullet points. Anyway, um, there was good training delivered in a timely manner, and I think this is really, yeah, power pointlessness. I think this is a really, really important point. There is an insistence that the multimedia is incorporated into the curriculum rather than introduced as an add-on. Now, I, I actually think this is really crucial because so often I think that many people ask the wrong question, even though it may be a necessary one. They, they ask, how can I use this application in my teaching? And to me, that's like starting with the, the technology and hoping it will lead to the educational bit. And for me, a much better question is, what applications can I use to help my students achieve X? So that starts with the education and it leads on to the technology. I think there's a reason our, our area of expertise is called educational technology as opposed to technological education. Um, okay, so going back to the project, the question arises, has it achieved its original goals, which were raising standards, uh, the, the main ones are raising standards of literacy and improving attendance at parents' evenings. Now Maggie, the head teacher, says it's too early to be able to say anything precise like, yes, test results have improved by 2% or we have 20% more parents coming through our doors every day uh, on open days. However, there's no doubt that the children are happier and achieving more in terms of their literacy skills like to, uh, speaking and listening. And um, so I was just uh, slightly, uh, slightly taken aback by uh, Shambles' comment about the pencil. Quite right. Um, absolutely spot on. Um, now the children are working much better with each other 
and all the schools now are, are able to be more inclusive than they were. I don't know if that's a term that other countries have, but in this country, what it means is is um, having inclusion is including every child. So you don't have special needs children as some kind of separate entity. Um, everyone can take part in all of the activities. And the really good thing is that more and more parents are starting to take an interest in what the school is doing with their own child. Now, now what's also interesting is when you actually talk to the children and the teachers, it's, it becomes really clear that the goals of the UK's Every Child Matters policy, which I'll just come up, uh, put up on the screen if I can find it. Okay, that, that's um, the Every Child Matters policy. And, and the really interesting thing is that all of these, in some form, form or another, have been achieved through this project and are being achieved through the project almost by accident. So um, it would seem that if you introduce multimedia in a, in a careful way, in a planned way, and, um, and you've got a team of dedicated and enthusiastic teachers, you can revitalize the curriculum and get children of all ages excited about going to school, which is kind of an achievement in itself. <laughs> um, just one thing I'd like to point out about this, it, the whole idea of this is that it puts the child at the centre of, of all of these services. So the idea is that all of these services come to the child rather than child and their parents having to go and seeking out all of these services. And from that point of view, schools are hubs in the community. And that, that's quite important for this project, as I'll, I'll explain. Um, it's also reflected in in the name of our Department of Education. The, the UK actually doesn't have a Department of Education. It's called the Department of Children, Schools and Families, which um, no one could remember what the acronym stood for at first. So we call it the Department of Cushions and Soft Furnishings, which is probably a little bit disparaging, but still helps us re remember. But it does actually reflect that that's, that's where, where we stand with regard to the place of the child. And although this bears a superficial resemblance to um, the, the, U, the USA's No Child Left Behind, but my perception of that, although I, I, I'm English, so I probably don't know and I'm talking out of turn, but my perception of that is that it's mainly to do with test results and is focused very narrowly. Now, um, if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll wait for someone to uh, correct me and I'll stand corrected and apologize. But um, that, that, that's my perception anyway. Whereas the Every Child Matters agenda is much broader and wider. OK, um, let me talk to you about Newham and the schools because I'm, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because I think just to give you a, a little bit of a heads up of where I'm going with this is I think one of the key things for the success of any project is that you have to sow the seeds on fertile ground. And I want to show you how the ground here is incredibly fertile. So first of all, the area. Now, you can probably tell from that, even though it's only a screenshot, that Newham is actually quite dense. It's, it's, it's really packed in. In fact, the whole area is only about 22 square miles. And at one time, I don't think it's the case now, but at one time it was the most deprived area in, in the UK. Now, it's actually a very vibrant community. If you, if you walk, walk down the street in Newham, you will see just about every ethnicity you can imagine. I mean, I love it. I mean, it's just so incredibly vibrant. There's a market there which sells just about anything you'd want. You, if you walk... Um, I don't know, a hundred yards you will see Afro-Caribbeans, Asian people, um, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, you know, you get the picture. It's an incredibly vibrant community. And it, that's just not my imagination either because the 2001 census identified Newham as the most ethnic, ethnically diverse area in England and Wales. It's got a population of just under 240,000 people. And 
of those, 40% of them are under 25 years old, and 28% is under 16 years old, and that's the highest proportion of all London boroughs. Now, I think one of the really key things about um, about Newham is that being a very poor area, they seem to have taken the view, or the, the local authority seems to have taken the view that education is the best way out of po uh, poverty. So it's always had very high expectations of of what young people can achieve and what is expected of them. So, so Newham is actually at the forefront of lots of educational and uh, initiatives, especially ones involving educational technology or ICT, um, and it's got a very well-deserved reputation for innovation in this field. Now, let me talk to you about the schools because the schools are really interesting. In in this project, there were seven schools involved: six primary schools and one secondary school. And the interesting thing is, is that the secondary school wasn't allowed to benefit financially from this money, um, the $800,000, but they wanted to get involved anyway. And the reason they wanted to get involved was because they wanted to help ensure that the children who came to them from the primary school uh, were of such a high standard that, they, that the secondary school would be able to achieve even more than it is currently doing. Now, let me uh, just go through this. These are the logos of the individual schools. Let me talk to you about these schools. This school at the top here, this is a community school. That's, that's the secondary school I was talking about. And um, it's got over 1,300 students. And it's, as you can probably see there, it's a specialist performing arts college. They've got a dedicated multimedia suite, huge schools. Now, it's not related to this during as far as I know. Thanks, Mrs. Durf. And that curving school, that's the CPS. So they've got that nice little, um, what do you call it, slogan there, together everyone achieves more, which spells team. It's got 400 pupils, and they've been developing a curriculum in which ICT is embedded in every subject. And they want to be at the forefront as far as using a virtual learning environment is concerned. OK, this is Plasto School. Now, those flags there, I think that's a really nice logo, but those flags there uh, re represent all the nationalities of the people who go to that school. Uh, it's a marvellous logo, isn't it? I mean, it, you don't even need any words with it. It's brilliant. There's another school in the borough, just as a little aside, secondary school called Little Ilford. When I used to work in Newham, that, that, I suppose I ought to put that as a... Um, a declaration of interest in a way. I have worked in, in Newham and I'm still working for them. Um, I, when you walked into the reception, there was, uh, good, uh, there was the term welcome in something like 28 different languages, and those were the languages spoken in the school. And these logos at the bottom give you an idea of what kind of, uh, what kind of badges the school has gone for. Okay, so it's gone for the healthy school mark, an ICT mark, investors and people. So I, I think that's kind of important as well because it starts to give you an indication that what we've got here is uh, our schools which are already ready for this, you know, ready for new things. Now, I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to race on a little bit. Let me just, because I want to allow time for questions. That, that's Upton Cross Primary School. That's actually the smallest one in the whole lot. They've just got 350 children just over, but I've got this lovely vision statement. And um, it's just really simple. As a school, we will enable children to enjoy lifelong learning. I mean, that's fantastic, isn't it? Let me just move on, because you can always read these later. Um, that's Portway, the school I mentioned before, where Maggie, the head teacher, is, and Michael, the, the assistant head teacher. The Ofsted report, Ofsted is our inspection service, and they're very proudly saying they've got all these accolades from Ofsted, an outstanding school. That's the highest you can actually get in Ofsted. Selwyn School, um, they've got this deaf provision, and they've got all these accolades as well. That's a much smaller school. Let's go on. OK, so that's the, um, those are the main schools. There's another one called Southern Road School, which is also very nice. So 
I think if I was to say, well, what are the key elements about all of these schools uh, and, and the area? There are three things, really. First of all, the area is a poor one, but it sees education as a key element in helping pupils improve their life chances. Um, secondly, the, the local authority over the years has invested a lot of money in education and especially ICT. And thirdly, the, the, schools, the schools are ready to actually embark on such a project. And that comes back to what I was talking about, the, um, the, the, you know, the, uh, sowing seeds on fertile ground. Now, can we just go to the wall wisher thing? How do I do that? Or is someone going to do that for me? Peggy's going to initiate the web tour for you, Terry. Is it possible to go onto the internet? Thank you. What I want to show you is, because I've been talking about this overall multimedia project, but the thing is, the, the schools themselves all have different ideas about what they wanted to do. So what I've done is I've put this up as a, a wall wisher thing, if, if it comes up. I can't actually see it. Oh, yeah, OK, lovely. Now. I don't want to spend too long on this because I won't have oh, my browser has stopped working. Uh, right, everything has gone blank for me, so um, not to worry, I'm just going to close this. Yeah, I am going to wing it. Um, if you get a chance to have a look at that wall wisher project, uh, sorry, that wall wisher wall, what you'll see is, in fact, I've actually got, you can't really see that, but that, that gives you an idea of the number. There are about 30 of these projects. And the really key thing, I think, is when you look at them, you'll see that there's, there's no barrier to age. So some of the very early projects start at, in the nursery, which is four years old, reception, five years old, and, and that sort of thing. And all of the things, when you look at these projects, you'll see that they're all to do with the curriculum, and they're all relevant, and they're all really exciting. Okay. So I, I'm going to go on because we've got 15 minutes left. When, when I timed this, it seemed like um, it would, I'd have loads of time left, but um, now I'm running out of time. Let me just very quickly go through this because I want to allow time for questions. I uh, just want to go through the anatomy of a successful project. And um, that, that drawing was done by me. And I think you'll see when you look at that why I never became an art teacher. Okay, but, so I thought I'd get that in before someone else does. <laughs> so, um, OK, and there, there's one of our cats looking evil. Or a doctor, thanks. <laughs> yes, thank you. OK, let's move on. OK, now, first thing. Now, you might not agree with these. This is my experience from this project and other projects. OK, I don't want to come across as one of these people who are just telling you how it is and my word is law, and that's it. So but this is just my view on things which um, we can discuss. OK, so first thing is I think you, you absolutely need to get the key decision makers on board before you do anything else. So you actually need to say, well, who are these decision makers? And, and, and to me, they're, they're the people who can actually make things happen, or they're, they're the people who can stop things from happening, either by actively stopping them or simply by not doing things. Um, and, and I think that's... Uh, that's a really useful thing to bear in mind, not just for Web 2.0 projects or anything else like that, projects as such, but even things like getting ICT or educational technology embedded by, uh, by the teachers in the school. I see absolutely no point 
in banging your head against the wall trying to get some reluctant person to have a look if you can spend your time much more usefully getting enthusiastic people. You know, I, I would always start from that, that point of view myself. Now, the thing is, in the UK, last year I, I did a little bit of a quick back of the envelope analysis. And I, I discovered before I got bored with it, well not bored, but got too depressed and I stopped the exercise, I was trying to work out how many ICT initiatives were going on at the time. Now I think um, someone like Carol who's here, or Doug Woods, uh, I, I recognise some names here, possibly Chris Shambles, will, will, will bear me out on this. At this particular time, this was about a year or so ago, there were 40 initiatives going on. Uh, this is from secondary schools. There are 40 initiatives going on to do with ICT. So if you assume that the head teacher didn't do anything else, they would still only be able to spend one week a year on any one project. So um, I know this is kind of a little bit of a force, force accounting because head teachers delegate stuff, but it just gives you some sort of a, an idea. And I just think if you want to get head teachers on board, you actually need to say this project that I have in mind isn't going to add to your burden, but it's actually going to help solve some of the things that you're already trying to do. And I was giving a talk to some uh, trainee teachers um, last year, and what I did was I drew a, a, a kind of a matrix where I showed that if you address certain key things, like every child matters, which I went on to, which I talked about before, you automatically start to address certain other things. So you can start ticking the boxes. So the government keeps coming out with all these initiatives, but they're actually, they cross over. Okay, and I think if you want a, a project to succeed, you need to be able to say how it actually meets some of the aims that the school already has. Um, uh, just to remind you what the Every Child Matters thing is again, if I can find it, it's, it's that lot there. Okay. Um, Oh, let me pull the plug out. Okay, um, let me just go on very quickly. I'm sorry I'm talking so fast. If you want me to stop, I will. Okay, I think you need to agree on the teaching and learning aims of the project. And I think that is, <clears throat> I've been very careful there. When, when I was getting, or, or when I was working on the bid, what I did was I went around each school and I spent about two hours in each school talking to the teachers, talking to the head teacher and um, saying, what are your aims for this? And as soon as the head teacher said, well, what I'd like to do, what I'd like to have is the kids using um, video recorders to do X, I said, no, 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 stop there. Tell me what kind of learning you would like to see going on in your school. What would you like to see the children doing? And I think if, if you actually start from that, and um, you know, the head teachers don't always realize this. You'd think, well, they, they would. But they don't always realise it because of all these and other, other initiatives going on. You know, you get to the point where you can't see the wood for the trees. And I think if you can come along and say, now, what kind of school do you want? Oh, you want children collaborating. Okay, well, we could do that if they were working on a video project together because you need someone to write the script, someone to film it, someone to edit it. You know, before you look around, you've got collaboration. Um, okay, I'm just going to whiz on a bit. Okay, measuring success. That's one of my drawings as well. Um, so um, the thing is, you sometimes have to come up with criteria of success, which is which has got nothing to do with technology. And in this case, the DCSF, the, the Department for Children, Schools and Families, wanted us to achieve something like um, a five percent increase in the children's schools on English tests and an improvement in attendance at parents' evenings of 10%. So it's kind of really hard to say by using flip videos, these children, these children's parents are going to want to come into school. But so I had to say to the head teachers, look, are you sure you're comfortable and you're confident about meeting these? Because we didn't want to uh, fall foul. We, you know, basically we didn't want to have to pay the money back if we failed to meet the aims. Um, so, so all of this stuff is actually quite hard and it is a little bit of a leap of faith. And I would say at this point that once you've embarked on this, or even before you embark on it, you have to 
insist on on commitment. And um, you know, just to give you an idea of, of what I mean, is um, and it's, it wasn't to do with this project, but there was another project I was working on where we stood to gain something like forty thousand dollars, and I could not get hold of the head teacher I needed to get hold of. So in the end, I, uh, and I, I tried every kind of means possible. In the end, I sent him an email which said, "I'm afraid that unless I've heard from you by um, four o'clock this afternoon." I'm going to have to pull us out of this project and forego the forty thousand dollars. And funnily enough, I, I got a response by return, and, and he said, um, "Could you come along at five o'clock today?" And I said, "Yes." So my first words to him were, "Look, I understand people are very busy. If you don't have time to make the commitment for this project, then then let's shake hands and." I'll go back home, and there's no harm done. But the worst possible scenario would be for you to say, yes, 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 we want this, and then for the project to fail because of the lack of commitment, because um, there are a lot of people's reputations on the line here, including mine, and um, we don't want that to happen. And I do think sometimes you have to be a little bit robust in dealing with this kind of stuff. OK, just very quickly, getting the equipment, I would very, very strongly recommend, if at all possible, um, having someone in charge of just that. In Newham, we had what was called a preferred supplier, so we were able to have that supplier deal with everything, so that we didn't have the problem of one company saying, our stuff is excellent, but it doesn't work because you bought something else belonging uh, from another company, and vice versa. Okay, So I think um, that's really important. The importance of the community, I think um, I've already mentioned every child matters. I think it's very important to get the community involved and make the, the learning more meaningful. So for example, one of the projects going on in Newham is that the children record uh, record the recollections of elderly residents, so it becomes a kind of living history. And you can get that kind of thing out of books and films, but it's not the same as actually talking to people. Okay, um, let me just go on. Uh, sorry about this racing. Okay, I really, really think project management is absolutely key. Even if it's a really small project, you need to be able to say what is going to happen by when, what needs to happen in order for that to happen, and who's going to do what by when. Otherwise, things can just fall apart and slip and, and everything. OK? Oh, thanks for that uh, information, Peggy. I didn't know about that. Um, project management, I think, is absolutely key. And in this case, we had a fantastic project manager supplied by the local authority who is absolutely brilliant. So brilliant, in fact, that when he left, the schools were really worried. They thought the, school, the, the project was going to fall apart. But in fact, they worked so well together that it didn't. And, and we knew it wouldn't. OK, I've already talked about that. Um, managing the project in school, um, I think um, you need to consider things like continuity. In one of the schools in Newham, uh, the ICT coordinator, which is like our version of the the technology coordinator in the States left. And it, it took quite a while for um, his replacement to, 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 to catch up with the project, because there was no mechanism in place for allowing that to happen. So I think that's quite important. Oh yeah, Peggy's mentioned the awards. There's an article on my website as well, which I'll try and dig out while I'm talking. OK. Um, sorry. Lost the plot slightly. Oh yeah. Okay. Right. The importance of working within the current framework basically goes back to what I was saying before, of saying this is how this is going to address the aims we already have. And if you go, if you think back to what I was talk, telling you about the, the individual schools, if you remember, they already had um, plans in place to develop multimedia in the curriculum. This wasn't an add-on. This was something which gave, was going to give them the means whereby they could achieve the aims that they had anyway. Okay? So it wasn't something extra. The importance of senior leadership is next, and I really think that is key. If you haven't got senior leadership with you, you may as well all go go home. Um, in, in the Newman project, every single head teacher was absolutely dead keen on it. The um, 
Oh, thank, thanks, Peggy, for that. And in fact, um, yeah, that's that's yeah, that's uh, quite a good article, even though I wrote it myself. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyway, so that's the importance of uh, key leadership, senior leadership. Well, what the children thought um, and what the teachers thought, they absolutely loved it. I've lost my notes here, so I've all fallen apart. But just going by memory, they absolutely loved it. We had these. Um, marvellous discussions with the children and I was hoping I could actually play you some of them but the schools were kind of a little bit unhappy about that because of child safety issues which I, I imagine you can you can understand. There, there was a great sense of community. Um, the schools were collaborating with each other. They opened their doors to teachers from other schools so like one school would, would run a training session and invite all the other training, all the other schools to come to it. They worked as a group of schools together to plan the training session, so there wasn't overlap or it wasn't the case of one school running a training session where no one else could get to it from another school. There was that. Um, unintended consequences. Um, just to give you an example, there was an, an autistic boy who never spoke and um, as a result of this project, he became incredibly animated and um, would, would talk non-stop about this project. And, and it became a kind of go-to person in his classroom for that. There was another girl who was very, very shy, wouldn't say anything, but she did find that she was able to record her, her thoughts using an Eddie Roll voice recorder and then allow that to be played in the class. So it's all, all these wonderful things which she couldn't really plan for. Those, those are just two of them, there were loads of them. Uh, writing up the project, I think it's important to be aware of the need to write the thing up in different ways. So for this project, for example, I, I wrote up a case study in, in uh, kind of normal language for parents and I wrote another part of it. Uh, so I, I wrote an evaluation as well which was full of stuff about targets and everything for the DCSF. And here are some wordles which are taken from the project that I've been running. Sorry, the, the quest for Web 2.0 projects. These are the benefits of Web 2.0 that people have discovered, uh, decided, participation, collaboration, so you can see for yourself. Uh, recommendations in ter terms of getting things off the ground, there's that. I won't go into that, but you can see teachers, learning project. Okay. Um, come back to that in a second. Let me just draw your attention to, to this if I may. Um, I, I've decided to extend the deadline for this request for Web 2.0 projects for the people who are listening to this. So there's information here about that. Uh, so far I've received about 103, uh, sorry, 104 submissions. I can't use all of them, but there are something like 60 or 70 which are absolutely fantastic and really, really simple. Now, I've allowed two minutes for discussion. I'm really, really sorry about that, but um, are there any questions? <laughs> If you have a question, you can go ahead and ask Terry. Um, we hope that you'll be able to stay on a little bit after um, the hour passes. And uh, um, Carol and anyone else, if you've got a situation where you can't share the URL. Um, what I would suggest is, if you could, is take a few screenshots because the idea of the URL was really to give people an idea of what the project actually looked like. So if you can't provide a URL, then, then if you can provide a few screenshots with the children's names blanked out, just to give people an idea, that, that would work as well. Um, how do I deal with a hand raise? Sorry. Um, Alistair? Um, did you have a question that you wanted to ask or make a comment? You have the microphone. Um, yes, thanks. I'd just like to ask Terry whether he's found any difficulty with accessing certain Web2 tools because of the local authority firewalls. I've, I work in schools across the Northwest and I find that there are quite a lot of sites which are not bad in themselves. 
as in the threat to, to pupils' e-safety. But so there's generally a blanket policy in some of the LAs I work in um, that they'll block a lot of their Web2 tools. Um, just wonder how we can deal with that one. OK. Uh, can I just say, Alistair, I mean, it's a great question. Can I just preface my answer by saying my website has been blocked by, by the Southwest Grid for Learning, I think it is. And the reason it's been blocked um, is because I wrote an article um, about the pros and cons of social networking. And somehow or other, because I mentioned social networking, it's been blocked. So right. I did ask them to unblock it. And I'm not sure if that's happened, because I didn't really get a response. So I think local authorities are really, really frightened. And, and the way I've advised people to, <laughs> thanks, the, the way I've advised people to get around it is it's a bit of a clutch, really. But it's to try and make sure that the learning platform they're using, or the virtual learning environment they're using, at least allows them to, to um, repli replicate the functionality of some of these kind yeah. of tools, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that, that's the only way. So I, mean, I think it's daft, really. And I think it's a real shame. But uh, I think that's the reality we're in. Every, everyone is so frightened of things like child safety issues and, and so on and so forth. It, it, yeah, it's a really, yeah. really big issue. I, I, I come across it all the time. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Alistair. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the show. We're going to uh, formally close it out, but we hope that you will stay after. And if you have questions, you can ask Terry um, your questions. And if you have to leave, we certainly understand that. Our next show on November 28th, right after Thanksgiving for the uh, those who are celebrating in the United States and around the world, um, who are celebrating with the United States uh, holiday, is going to be on the latest news about the K-12 online conference. And we'll have the K-12 uh, conference co-conveners on our show, as well as the chairman uh, or the head person of the live event. But we hope that you will join us next Saturday at the same time. And Steve Hargadon has created and founded several Ning sites and um, interview series. And on December 1st, he will be interviewing Dan Willingham and talking about why students don't like school. And that's part of the Future of Education series at 1 p.m. And I apologize, I'm losing my microphone off and on. So um, I'm going to go ahead and continue. Uh, we'll be interviewing Dan Willingham on December 1st, a Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific and 4 p.m. Eastern, and hope that you will join Steve for that interview series. And the tentative date on December 2nd, Steve will be interviewing Julie Young at 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, once that's confirmed, you will receive uh, a notice in via email. And we hope that you'll join him for that session. And Curtis Bonk on The World is Open, his new book. Steve will be interviewing Curtis on December 3rd, that Thursday, at 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern. And that's going to be a huge event, I'm sure. So you'll want to make sure that you get here early to make sure that you get into the room and everything and you can connect. And the session, the survey will pop up at the end once you exit the, the session. And we hope that you will give us great feedback and suggest some topics that you'd like to see us cover in the future. We are also offering professional development certificates. So when the survey opens, if you will please indicate your name and your email, we will get those out to you shortly. It takes a few days for us to receive the results and get everything processed. So uh, be patient. Give us a little bit of time, but you will certificate.
And we'd like to extend a very special thanks to our special guest for today, Terry Friedman, as well as to Steve Hargadon, who is the founder of Classroom2.0.com and Future of Education and Conversations Ned. And thank you to each of you who participated in today's show. We're greatly appreciative of that. And we want to especially thank Illuminate and Learn Central for providing this forum for us to meet each and every week. And now I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Terry. So if you have a question that you would like to ask of Terry, you can raise your hand by clicking on the hand with the little green arrow. And we will give you the ability to use your microphone. Or you can type your question in the chat. So go ahead. And if you have questions or you'd like to share a comment, please do that now. Nilesh, okay, well, let me go ahead and give you the microphone. You can now use your microphone, Nilesh. You click on the microphone button in the bottom left, Nilesh, if you're going to use your computer microphone. If not, you can type your... Hello. Hello, I see you your mic is available, is active, but Hello. I don't hear you, Nilesh. So you may want to use the audio setup wizard. Can you hear me now? Find that under tools and then select no, audio. I can, hear you. can you hear me okay, now? Okay, there we go. Find that under tools. Yes. You can hear me. We hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I am Nilesh. Yeah, actually, I work in Dubai, but I'm from India. I, I just wanted to ask you where. where yes, we you can. Let me right now. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. Hello. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Where do you see the future of? Uh, do you think it's going to be a bubble or all this kind of going to go to? Uh, Sorry. Uh, uh, do you think that Web2 is the future tech uh, technology embedded learning is the future of education and the classrooms are going to be without books like you can teach the whole lesson using Web2 technology? Yeah, that's the question. Okay. Where do you see the future of Web2 wow. when it comes to technology embedded yeah. learning? Um, that's, that's a really good question. And um, if, if you remember, right, right, if you were here at the beginning, I, I said um, I took a very pragmatic. If you were here at the beginning, I, I said. Um, I sorry, I'm getting some really funny noise. Um, I take a really pragmatic approach to all of this. So people have been talking about about Web 3.0, and um, you know, I, I, I don't know if Web 2.0 as such is the future of education. However, my view is, is that education has always been about children interacting with each other, good education rather, children interacting with each other, interacting with the teachers, participation, involving the community. Um, so whether that's through Web 2.0 or through some stuff that hasn't been invented yet, I don't know. But I do think that's the future. And I also think if you look at what a lot of, com a lot of companies are doing, I, 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 I've been organized or I had, have organized events called Inside the Workplace, which is where uh, you, you arrange for teachers to go to companies to see what they're doing. And, and I arranged about six or seven of these. And every single company that we went to was using to Web 2.0 to the extent that they were saying, well, we can't not use it. Um, I, I, I think schools in that regard it, uh, are a little bit behind the time. So I, I don't know if this kind of stuff will ever replace books. I wouldn't have thought so, but um, who knows? I definitely think anything which enables people to participate and do real work is, is going to be the future. Thanks. Yeah, schools without Thanks, walls, Nellis. definitely. Thanks, Nellis. Do we have anyone else who would like to ask a question? If so, you can raise your hand, or you can type your question or chat in the chat.
you know, that kind of thing has been And going, going Harry, you can um, continue presenting. Sorry. Um, yeah, just, thanks, Peggy, I will. Um, just, just to answer um, Carol, I think that kind of thing has been going on for a while in Japan. And it is coming here. Um, you see it on the side of coat tins and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, Kathleen, I'm not sure where the best place to start is. I've always started. Um, I've always started on on what works for me on on the basis of a of a of a particular need. So, for example, for this presentation, I used Wallwisher, and that was actually the first time I've used it. I thought I need a way of presenting these projects in a way which um, is interesting and dynamic and reflects the kind of subject matter I'm talking about. And I thought, oh. Uh, Warwisher, that sounds good. Um, um, that's what I used. Now, in terms of how I plan to announce and distribute the Web 2.0 project ebook, um, I'm going to give a, be giving a talk at the BET show in January 2010, and um, that's uh, that's the biggest educational technology show in England. I think it's one of the biggest in the world, actually lasts for about three days, and I'm giving a talk there called Fantastic Web 2.0 Projects, and it's there where I'm going to release it, as it were, for the first time. So if you want to be first off the mark and get it straight away, then you've got to attend my session. And um, as, as that's impossible for some people who, uh, who live on the other, other side of the world, all I can say is that shows a remarkable lack of commitment. But anyway, that, that, so it will be the second week in January when I stream my session. Um, I, uh, I can ask if it is being streamed. I'm not sure how, if they're going to do it, because I'm not in charge of all of that kind of stuff. But um, that's a really good point. I will certainly, certainly ask. In fact, I'll ask straight after this. I'll ask the organizer if he can possibly stream it, because I think that would be fantastic. But after that, after the third week in January, it will be available for the website. And I, I should have just mentioned that the current one, um, oh, thanks, Doug. Yeah, I did wonder, because there are absolutely dozens of presentations that were going on at the same time. The, the, current, ish, the current edition of this Web 2.0 projects book, which is completely free, has been downloaded nearly um, well, around 12,000 times in the last year. I'm not sure if that's a lot or not. It sounds a lot to me. It means that 12,000 people have um, seen 60 fantastic ideas that they may not have come across. And the idea is really, and I would say this to the people who are still here, which is quite a lot, is um, people have been reluctant to submit stuff because they've emailed me to say, I'm sure my project isn't really good. It's just a small project and I, I'm new to all this. Well, I, I actually think sometimes it's the new people who come out with the best ideas because they don't have any of the preconceptions that people like me have, uh, may have developed over the years. Uh, that's fantastic, um, Mrs. Durf. Thank you for that. So I would say um, if you think your project sucks, to use an Americanism, don't worry about it. Just send it in, and I'll let you know if it sucks. But <laughs> But I'll say it in an incredibly nice way, okay? So, so let me be the judge of that, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did American as well. I'm very kind with my feedback. I'm never giving you any bad feedback, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, do you know if Wallwisher can be um, password protected? Yeah, it can. Um, what I've done with the current one is because it involves children's work, I mean, I would love you all to comment on the projects if you can. Um, but because it involves stuff which isn't mine, I've um, made it so that the comments are moderated so they may not appear straight away. But I'm, it would be, I should have said this before, it would be absolutely wonderful for the schools involved, and maybe the head teacher I mentioned, if people could look at these projects and, and put their own sticky up and say what they think. That would be absolutely wonderful if I could say to them, look, this is what people are thinking about your project. But I think because I, I want to 
I don't want to hurt their feelings. If you were to say this is absolute rubbish, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't do that. But uh, I wouldn't publish that. But um, yeah, definitely. What's this? Oh yes. Oh yeah. There's a form there. It takes about five minutes to fill the form in. And even if you're incredibly verbose, it'll still only take you five minutes because I've put a limit on the number of characters you can put. <clears throat> but yeah, do do go to that wall wisher and look at the projects and comment if you can. It'd be great. <laughs> Does anyone have a question that they would like to ask of Terry or make a comment? I'm really surprised that no one's asked to uh, how they can buy any of my original artwork, but still. Okay, share how they can do that then. <laughs> there, how can we buy some of your artwork, Terry? <laughs> So, no questions. Does that mean I've covered everything, or does it mean I've kind of browbeaten you into submission? I just think there's been so much to process and to think about, and so much potential, you know. Yeah. Well, I think I do. You know, we can keep talking about yes, and we can keep talking about this for days and days. Yes. Well, that's a good point. Before Save we let Terry go, um, does any does anybody have um, a question or a comment that they'd like to share? Kim, I would like to ask something of Terry. Sure. Um, I don't know, Terry, if you are aware that I am the show host for Parents as Partners at EdTech Talk. And uh, uh, no, I wasn't. Sorry. One of the things I and working on is to try and uh, bridge that gap between school and parents, which you've so nicely covered in some of your presentation today. And I'm looking for a connection with Becta or even yourself to talk about your role as that connector part into helping parents understand what you talked about today. So, mm. I don't know if it's at this moment we can contact, we can talk later about this subject. I just want to put it in your head before you walk off today. Okay? Yeah, thank you. I mean, can you send me an email? Can you put your details here? Because Doug has asked as well. And something you might like to look at is. Uh, I love everything from Net Generation. I've just been right into the website. It's terrific. Um, if I'm really good at typing, I'll get the URL for that. Thank you, Kim, for putting it in at Tech Talk. Oh, OK. Right. Lovely. Thank you. It's, it's just I'm not aware or familiar with the organization. Peggy said you, you've done quite a bit of work with them. I don't yes, know how to, how to manage to get that all that content with someone from the other side of the Atlantic to this side of the Atlantic and engaging with some of our parents here. But I know I've had parents draw my attention to that net uh, generation learning as well. So it's kind of good information. So again, I dropped my yeah, uh, yeah. Twitter ID in there. Um, here's my website. It's rschool.ca. And you can see we're trying to develop with some of the other teachers in our network on a digital parent um, program or opportunities to learn about Web 2.0. So obviously I didn't do something right typing in my URL. Oh, it's all right. You put a semicolon in, but I can, I I can did. understand it. I am dyslexic when it comes to, to typing. Don't worry. There, there it goes. I'll so look that up. And does that have your email address on it? I hope so. But we're, we're sharing the Google Doc this week. So I'm in oh, there. Okay. And I know how to, I'll track you down as well. So. Look at that. Yes, we yeah, have a great fantastic. team. Thank you. Yes. Great support, Peggy and Kim. Yeah, definitely. It's been mar marvelous. Okay. Well, I won't keep your time anymore today. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you.
Okay, last call for Terry. Do you have a list of tools that you like, Terry? A list of tools that I like? Deb asked that question. Oh, sorry. Um, um, God, I like so many. I keep discovering new ones every day in Twitter and everything. Well, I really like Wallwisher now that I've used it. Um, I love um, all of Google's tools, except Wave. I haven't quite got into that yet. And um, I love kind of traditional Web 2.0 tools, if that's not a contradiction in terms, things like blogs and wikis. Oh, I'll tell you what I do like. Um, Deb has just reminded me. I, I love Digo or Digo, however you pronounce it. I absolutely love that. I use that Digo. loads. Digo, yeah, I, I, I mm -hmm. really, really love that. Not least because by saving stuff in that, it goes to delicious as well. I, I think that's got so many uses, and I, I've actually used it to um, publish stuff to my website automatically when I haven't had the time to, to do it, if you see what I mean. Bookmark a few things there and have it automatically come up. It's absolutely wonderful. Yes, we love Digo too. We yeah, have a question through that old, yeah, live group there, and, and we share resources through there as well. Fantastic. Ooh. Is it possible to get the results of the Google survey? Lauren, are you referring to the one that, with the two questions that we filled out? Right, because it, it, when I went into the results, or maybe it was the link I had, I didn't have access. Maybe I don't have the public link. I know some other people had difficulty today trying to get in to see what the results were, but we could have been technically challenged or had the wrong link or anything like that. Great. Okay, any last questions or comments? I know we've taken up a great deal of your time, Terry, and, and we thank you so much for staying on extra half the hour. We're very grateful for that. And for everybody um, joining us today, we appreciate you spending time with us. And next Saturday, after the Thanksgiving holiday, we're going to have the K-12 online conference co-conveners with us um, just before the K-12 online conference kicks off. So we hope that you'll join us at the same time next week. Um, and you can uh, sign up and register. You don't need to like register for the conference because they will post the, the different presentations online. And you can view and virtually um, attend the presentations online. So please join us next Saturday as we get the final updates of the Kim, of the keynotes and so forth that are planned and the great things that are in the works. So be sure to join us next week as we talk all about the 2009 K-12 online conference. Okay, Kim, and Carol wants go to ahead. say something. Give her access to the mic. Okay, she wanted just a sec to test her mic. Um, Peggy went ahead and posted her uh, the links to the results for the spreadsheet. So uh, be sure that you um, talk that you Whoa. can click. Uh huh. Be sure and click Hi. on that to get the results of the uh, session of the um, survey that we completed in the beginning of the session. Go ahead, Carol. Hi, I just wanted to say this is wonderful. What great professional development, and happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Thank you so much, Did you Carol. Hear me? We appreciate that. Thanks a lot. And if there aren't any more questions, be sure to fill out the survey. And if you'd like uh, the professional development certificate, please. In, include your information in the survey, and we will email that to you. 
have a wonderful Thanksgiving, everybody. And if you're not celebrating Thanksgiving next week, then have a great weekend and a great week next week. So thank you again for joining us today. And thank you, Terry. Yeah, and thanks for have a your, great afternoon. Yeah, thanks for moderating it so well. Thanks, Terry. We appreciate it. Okay, look forward to chatting with you all next week then. Bye.